Okay, we uh, wanted to play a quick video before the start of today's program. I'm John Haber. You've probably seen me before on these sessions, but uh, we're going to play a word from our sponsors here before the start of this program. So give me a second to cue this up. My name is Ray Adamick and I am president of Spectre Company. We are the largest company in the western United States specializing in historic construction, rehabilitation, preservation and conservation. Over the past 30 years Spectre Company has completed hundreds of award-winning projects and restored some of the most iconic historical, architectural and cultural landmarks in the western United States. We built an amazing in-house team of over 150 artisans, craftsmen, construction managers, and preservation professionals who know how to restore historic buildings from start to finish. What makes us unique is that our comprehensive list of services enables us to handle all aspects of a project, from pre-construction, all the way to post-construction and everything in between, including ongoing maintenance. Our services range from preservation consulting to general contracting, building relocation, structural seismic retrofitting, historic materials restoration, conservation, and much, much more. At Spectra Company, we're motivated by three core principles, respect, restore, and revitalize. I am proud to lead the Spectra Company team. Our passion for history, honesty, and integrity, and an unparalleled performance go a long way to making us the number one choice in historic construction. Uh, welcome everybody to tonight's program. We'll start here uh, in a minute. I just wanted to get our broadcast on Facebook going and also go through a few uh, minor items with you. Um, as you know, this program is a special evening program for an hour and a half in length and we uh, encourage your active participation in the chat. Uh, we're really excited about the group of speakers we have here today. So feel free to use that chat right now and let us know where you are right now. And um, we look forward to having this program. I think you'll learn a lot about NEON tonight. So let us know where you are. Great, we have uh, people from all over here. We have Hawaii and Hollywood, Chicago and Glendale, Coachella Valley, uh, Sierra Foothills, San Francisco, Merced. A lot of Californians here, um, Los Angeles. Um, we, uh, we've we been telling people that we have people from five or six countries at this conference and uh, over 30 states, right, Chris? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I have a double mute to protect me from my own problems. Hello, John, and welcome everybody to our evening event. And we are joined by Gretchen Hilliard Boyce. You might have seen her over these uh, last couple of days of conference. And this is the perfect time to join us for an evening event because we've been on Zoom for probably a solid 10 hours. Isn't that right, John? 
uh, maybe 12 hours for me. <laughs> um, but it's great having uh, our co-producers here because I don't think any one of us could do it without the other. It's been a true team effort all day. It's definitely team. And thank you, Gretchen, who is volunteering because she just loves being on Zoom with the two of us, right, Gretchen? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all of our favorite thing to do right now, isn't it? Yeah, well, we've had the best time at this conference, and I want to just welcome everybody. Uh, this is going to be such a fun program. And as you know, just to get us started, if you haven't joined us before, you'll know that uh, we use the chat window the entire time, like John has mentioned. If that does disrupt your experience, you can minimize it. And also, we have uh, Gretchen has activated the closed captioning, so you'll see the live transcript at the bottom. You can, you can show it or hide it with the little carrot arrow next to there. And we will be using the Q&A box. So if you have a question for any of our speakers tonight, you can post in the Q&A and then John and I and Gretchen can kind of keep track of that. If you see a question you like, you actually can upvote it and use the thumbs up and bring it to the top of the list. You got anything else, John? No, I'm wondering what you call a, a neon, is it a neon bender or um, somebody who creates Neon, maybe our uh, panelists can help answer our question here. I thought maybe you're talking on. about cocktail hour, like we're on a, the be the name of the event. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be that. I was thinking that, you know, we forgot to provide a drink uh, uh, suggestion for tonight. So um, I would probably choose the blue lady because it's got this really blue, like glowing neon look to it. But I'm wondering what our panelists would choose for tonight. Oh, well, they can share. And speaking of our panelists, John, nice segue. <laughs> I would like to ask uh, Chris Nichols uh, and all of our panelists, actually, can you go ahead and turn on your videos, Corey, uh, Al and Randall? So we can introduce everybody and then we'll move into the program. Uh, I have, uh, as you can see, uh, Chris, Al and Randall and Corey. Chris, why don't you just give us a real quick uh, note uh, who you are and where you're calling in from. Sure. I'm calling uh, from Rosemead, California, near Pasadena, where I live. Um, and I've been involved in preservation for about 30 years um, and trying to save mid-century modern buildings. I am a columnist at Los Angeles Magazine. Here's a, uh, we've been around for 60 years this year. And um, I wrote, uh, written a couple of books, but this is the latest one, Walt Disney's Disneyland, uh, architectural history and a history of, a, of it uh, being built in Anaheim. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and Alan Randall, where are you calling in from and what do you do? We're Is it neon? calling in from uh, San Francisco, uh, where it's a cool, I think about 54 degrees right now. And we are San Francisco Neon, just the two of us, a small nonprofit organization that's dedicated to preserving the legacy of vintage commercial neon signage. Uh, we do that through publications, preservation, education, history tours, and sign rescue projects. And we partner with a lot of local history um, organizations. And uh, we, we love doing projects with Museum of Neon Art, our friends down to the south. Speaking of that, Corey, that's your cue. <laughs> uh, it's a love fest right back and forth. Um, we love working with SF Neon and we'll be talking a little bit more about that in our presentation. My name is Corey Siegel and I'm the executive director of the Museum of Neon Art. We are um, 40 years old this week. This is our 40th birthday this week. And we're an exhibition space as well as um, a, um, you know, a museum dedicated to restoring and preserving neon artworks and historic signage. And I'll be gabbing your ear off um, shortly about what we do. I, I can't wait to hear about that. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. And I just wanted to you know, honor all of your expertise. And uh, I've, we've been hearing a lot in the conference the last two days about also honoring all of our ancestors whose shoulders we stand upon. So I'd just like to mention that. Uh, why don't we go ahead and Chris, we'll start with you and we'll catch up to uh, Corey next and then Alan Randall at the end of the program. Sounds good. Okay, let me share my screen and okay it's all you chris do you see that do you see the roy's motel yes it looks great okay cool so um you know how sometimes movies are adapted from books or comic books this is this is a, this is a movie adapted from a facebook post um 
I, I mentioned the other day that uh, we had lost some important Motel Neon and sort of while we were not uh, on the road every day looking at things. And I just um, wanted to mention a few recent losses and pay homage to these places and just sort of explain what, um, what, I, what I've spotted around recently and uh, what I'm thinking about. This is the Great Roy's Motel out in Amboy, the whole town owned by one person who recently restored this sign even though the restaurant and motel have been closed for many years. Um, so there are gonna be a couple of survivors and a couple of restorations just to, to uh, show up in this. Um, the reason I started thinking about motels this week is because I like to throw a, a big party talking about history. You know, I like to do sort of a, uh, you know, bring my friends out to a historic location and, and sort of place them there. So here we are in early California at the uh, Palomara as Adobe or at Union Station on a restored uh, train car, uh, sort of during a noir era thing, or maybe it's 1966 and Julie Newmar has come to see the Batman crew at a historic uh, theater in LA. Um, one year I decided to do it uh, as sort of a homage to early LA television. And I did, a, I thought I'd do it at the Wigwam Motel and had a whole story about performers coming out of Route 66 and uh, traveling to LA. Um, and we did it with a, an old LA TV host, a great guy, Tom Hatton, that was a uh, childhood hero of mine who I called out and he did this uh, kids show where he drew Popeye for the kids. And anyway, he did it on stage for us and it was a lot of fun. So I got to thinking about how wonderful the motel was for a party, what a great venue it was. And I thought, well, you know what, maybe I'll look for another motel and do another, another story there. And so I started looking around at um, some of the motels and what was the state of historic LA motel dumb in 2021. And um, I was thinking about a program I went to years ago at the Hollywood Colonial Hotel on Western Avenue above Hollywood Boulevard. Um, there was a really neat art show that I attended there and I thought, well, man, maybe, maybe I'll do something like that, you know? And I was thinking about the Hollywood Colonial, you know, here with its columns and its uh, balustrade and uh, the uh, shutters and and it was still very, um, still sort of very much like this until recently, um, you know, but this hotel built in 1947 had kind of fallen on hard times and in 1969 had declared bankruptcy. And a few years later, they were running weird ads like this um, where it sort of had turned into maybe a uh, hotel of ill repute uh, and it become had called the Coral Sands. Here's an artistic photo by Pat Rocco of it in the 1970s when it was a home for ambitious boys. Um, the Hollywood Sands, uh, the Hollywood Colonial became the Coral Sands. You'll notice the great sign with the uh, lantern on top there on the left. And it was still very intact and, um, and had been used for a number of, of uh, kind of weirdo art events that were kind of inspiring and great. Now it's the Cara Hotel. And it went from a total um, flop house to a $350 a night luxury hotel, but they kept their sign structure, but totally um, removed any of the historic elements and also obliterated any of the colonial architecture that was still on the building. And it's just gone very fancy um, and very different and not what I was looking for. So, you know, another colonial motel, this one in Long Beach, Signal Hill area, um, also lost its colonial architecture for the most part, gaining quatrefoils, styrofoam quatrefoils, which is an interesting idea. But you'll notice the lettering um, has the scintillating incandescent bulbs on it, along with what is probably is or was neon behind it. But you know, even those whoop, are gone. And this is kind of how you, um, you know, you start to chip away at these things to the point where there's not hardly any, you know, hardly have any of it's left. This is a technique where they put LEDs on it, but to, to make them look less horrible, they cover them in plastic. Um, so you have just a solid glowing surface instead of the little scintillating light bulbs. Um, another one in sort of the East LA area, you know, great, you know, very simple, but very intact neon, whoop, LED. And so you cover up the, uh, the exposed tubes, you know, different letter forms, um, just changes the whole flavor and mood of the sign. And, you know, this one's got a great um, pole sign on the left, which is intact there. And then you've got this great entryway sign. This is in Studio City on Ventura Boulevard. Um, you know, this would have been a great place to do an event with all these little rooms. You could have had each one um, done, you know, done up as something different. 
anyway, so I thought this might be a place to look into, but oh, it's gone plastic. So you replace the neon with the backlit plastic and suddenly I'm, I lose interest in it. Um, although it does have some nice uh, landscaping that's grown up. That's at least a positive. Still got its pole sign. The Olive Motel in Silver Lake, uh, you know, very simple little streamlined modern number here. Um, also kind of shady, but um, had this really great sign that complete, completely original made it work and it's gone. And I saw that one in a vintage shop. So somebody thought it was important, but obviously not the people running the place. The Royal Viking in the sort of Koreatown area of LA on Third Street in Vermont was very intact. It, it, the whole hotel turned into um, multiple themes and names it seemed. They didn't really have a lot of branding. It was the Pod Inn. Um, and then at some point that was not successful and they went back to the Royal Viking, but in a different way, likely an LED solution underneath that plastic. And yet using the name and the uh, crown logo and the sort of idea of royalty in the sign, um, in a way, covered wagon in Buena Park near Disneyland was um, uh, subject of a lot of nuisance calls. Shows up in the newspaper a lot. Uh, the city trying to shut it down, and it uh, it's kind of a uh, um, you know the owner is saying we're 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 planning on getting the reform here, you know, and and they never did, and they kept getting shut down, kept getting shut down. But before they shut down for good and put it up for sale recently, they made sure to obliterate all the original neon. Um, this is an unusual thing where they took LEDs and made them into uh, wagon wheels, which I imagine maybe move. I'm not sure. I haven't seen this one at night. It's all happened very recently. And, you know, I think every one of these pictures is in the last three years. The Loop Motor Lodge um, just heard that this one in Ventura had gone. So I couldn't find and the, the Google Street View still looks like this. So I called them and they said, um, oh, no, no, we didn't take our sign now. We didn't damage our sign. We didn't change our sign. We just fixed our sign, you know? We fixed it and it works now. And this is what they were sold. Um, another LED conversion. Doesn't even have the name of the motel on it. Um, oop. The Half Moon in Culver City, magnificent sign. Look at that thing. Um, you know, with the, uh, with the moon there, this, the motel, very original, very intact rooftop sign, the, the flagstone. It even has these original, um, uh, railings and and uh, very intact and then suddenly it's gone and it's now the Galaxy Inn which sounds like it might have gone with that moon sign if they had been a little more clever about it but you know it's uh, just obliterated it's even got those arches I'm not sure what this is going for what you know what this design is trying to evoke it's certainly not space age or Spanish or Italian or whatever it's trying to be it's just horrible sorry the Oasis was a really wonderful design, um, this sort of uh, amoeba shape and this um, trail of planets sort of, or, or, or trail is this sort of thing going down, this hanging, this, it's gone. So the Tuscan Garden uh, is one of the sites that's being used for Los Angeles's project, uh, project um, Room Key which is a project to put homeless people into hotels, motels uh, during the pandemic and possibly permanently. And so now the city um, of Los Angeles has started to acquire motel properties, which will only speed the loss of these places. Because when you're not a motel, you don't need a motel sign. Although this one run by the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, which is now getting into the motel business, um, this one, this is like, um, you know, after it had already been sort of obliterated, you know, much of the architectural feet. There's another one of those styrofoam quadrupoils in the front. This one um, lost its flagstone, lost a lot of its original detailing and was looking pretty shabby, but it can look even worse, you know? So uh, right in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard. Here's an interesting way to look at something over a longer period of time. Google Street View is wonderful because you can go back to 2007, 2008 and see things evolve over time. But this is a photograph by Ed Ruscha taken in around 1966 on Sunset Boulevard. Um, and Ruscha uh, photographed Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard multiple times over the last 50 years. And the Getty Museum has all of this available now as a project called 12 Sunsets. You should Google that. 
and I guess he shot it 12 times. So this is Sunset Boulevard in 1966, the Hollywood townhouse. Not, not, you know, not the greatest example, but a really good solid Googie era motel. Uh, on the right, you'll see it has a neon sign. And um, <clears throat> this one has these, uh, um, you know, has the wall mounted sign, has the pole sign, has these um, vertical um, pieces here, the different paint job and the little louver windows. And then that, you know, a couple of years later, it's got a plastic sign. Still a good sign from the period, looking good. Painted out the details, got rid of the little reader board. Then it loses its E, it loses its, um, you know, loses its woodwork. Uh, now it loses its signage, its townhouse signage. It gets this more generic Helvetica typeface, but it's still got, you know, a few elements. And then it loses its windows and it loses its sign panels and it loses TO and HUSE and Holly, Holly, de, Holly. And, uh, you know, so just showing the gradual deterioration of a place over 50 years as it, you know, starts to fall apart. Uh, but, you know, it's not all bad news. <laughs> the Safari Inn in Burbank going strong, looking great. This is an example of a sign that originally read Safari Motor Inn or Motor Hotel, I believe and got a revamp in the maybe the 70s. It's just beautiful and perfect. It, one of the few times it actually in, improved the sign in my, in my, in my uh, observation. Uh, the shield, the, the great um, googie shapes there. Uh, and it, it's going strong. It's still, it's still a family motel, very, very successful, as is the Beverly Laurel in the sort of Fairfax neighborhood, which has had a, a bit of an upscaling, but um, still, you know, just kind of what it always was with the Googie Coffee Shop on the corner and, uh, and uh, you know, all night, all night coffee shop there and uh, the Avalon in Beverly Hills, formerly the Beverly Carlton, um, restored about 15, 20 years ago and doing great. Here's a uh, Marilyn Monroe and somebody recreating her pose there recently. People go, you know, tourism to these places to, um, to uh, enjoy the history and the architecture. Farmer's daughter lost part of, you know, that was a piece of its sign. Now it's a piece of decor. So, you know, maybe that's a solution in some ways to keep it on site. You know, that's not the greatest example, but it's a, it's an interesting way of, of dealing with it. Um, and then you have something like the pink motel, which is absolutely intact and looking good and frozen in time out in Sun Valley. And it is um, a 24 hour film location. So it's not even a motel anymore. It's, um, it's evolved into the next level, of, uh, into something else. So that's kind of a little snapshot of what's happening in um, motel. Um, you know, it's not even preservation, but in the in the sort of that's the status of roadside motels in LA and in 2021, things that disappeared while we weren't paying attention, while we were home locked down. So thank you very much. No, Chris, thank you. And that's what I had actually invited Chris. I saw something you posted on Facebook and I immediately wrote you a DM and I was like, can you show that on our, um, at, at our, our event tonight? Because I love the way the, when you said it's what happened when, when we weren't looking. And I really think that that has been a prevailing <laughs> a theme with a lot of preservation. I see a lot of my friends are in the chat and we've been through this before where, you know, you're busy or you're not looking or it's a Christmas day thing, you know, with Adrian Biondo and all y'all's with the, uh, with the, um, the broiler, you know, things that, that I've been involved with, like torn down on Christmas day, that kind of stuff. It's like when you're not looking is when these things go. And particularly compelling was that series of photos you showed how a building can deteriorate from one point just loses this that and as it proceeds through that um the timeline which means that stewardship is so important do you find that, that that's been true in your experience that stewardship and this transition from one owner to the next is really important oh always and i mean that's sort of the death by a thousand cuts right i mean um especially with modern buildings that really need to be presented in a in a more pristine way uh, uh you know a mission looks better the, the more the more it ages but a um, this is modern building commercial building really needs someone there to be on the ball and keep things going and keep the signage going and keep the lighting going and keep the landscaping intact I mean it's it's a um, it's a it's a near impossible job I think and when they do when they do do it right I do everything I can to support them 
So well, and our friend John English, he's in the chat right now, and a lot of us know John because uh, he's been involved for uh, John really a long time. <laughs> but uh, he had a point which is exactly true, and I have an object in my neighborhood, even in Florida, and I've talked to the neighbors about it. I said this could be gone. So John says, "You drive to work one day, you drive home, it's gone." Uh, you know, there's no protection for a lot of these. Uh, I think that has been another thing we've talked about during the conference, which is this uh, different aspects of integrity, uh, smaller things, intangible heritage. It just disappears, it seems like, overnight. And Wendy's aren't the single best example when it's more of a collection of things. It's a streetscape, it's a roadside, and you lose them all, they all blink out. It, you know, when do you get to the point where you try to save one? And mm -hmm. I don't believe there's one... I can't think of one roadside motel that's landmarked in LA, um, you know, and, and do you landmark the sign, you know, uh, that's very rare. Do, if it is it, you know, does do you send it off to a museum? Do you try to save it in place? Do you, you know, it's, it's really difficult. And even for those of us like John and Adrian and people that have been doing this for a long time and know this stuff really well, you know, we, we don't, we don't have the perfect solution for it. You know, it's really difficult. No, we're still working. I see Alan in there in the chat room too. And Alan has a couple of points. So definitely get into this chat room if you're not in there, because you'll see all of our friends there. But Chris, thank you for that uh, presentation. And you have teed up perfectly our next speaker. And Chris, you can hang around, right? And do some more yeah, Q&A at the end. Okay, well, I'd like to introduce Corey. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Corey, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you have to show. Sure. Um, so my name again is Corey Siegel. I'm from Mona and um, I'm so grateful to be here and Chris that was an amazing presentation and what you do for preservation is incredible and I'm just thrilled to be joined with SF Neon as well. Um, Corey before you start mm -hmm. we, if there's a box in front of your screen that is probably a zoom box if you could just scooch it over. It's, oh. I think it's probably the chat. Yeah, there you go. If you scooch it over and minimize it, um, because it that? shows, yeah, it shows up on the screen. Okay, let's see. I can uh, pull it to another window if you have another window, or just close it. I guess I'll do it blind, so I I won't be seeing the chat. But um, yeah, so um, preservation recognizes the power of objects and the way they are multivalent tools to understand the past and the present and the future. And um, before I start, I want to acknowledge the Shumach and Kish and Tongva peoples who stewarded the land that I'm on right now in the city of Glendale, California, and um, their past and present leadership. So I'm gonna share a video with you um, to just give you a little intro about Neon. Um, at Mona, we're kind of a hybrid of science, history, and art. We're seeing here um, the process of bending the arm for a diving lady on the top of our building, and the really amazing way that plasma can interact with the human body. We have shown many different um, really stellar exhibitions in our museum galleries. This is in our classroom. That's called the bombard or the manifold which is where we bombard and fill our signs with electricity um, and gas this is us installing the hand on our diver and this is our warehouse so um, in addition to our exhibition space in glendale we also have a pretty large warehouse in pomona and Neon has so many different kind of meanings and, you know, it, it has a lot of teeth, a lot of ways of grabbing at you. Um, and if you know what to look, it's sort of like a cipher in the landscape. So we do, you know, everything we possibly can to educate people about the very special um, place of neon art in community and how they can read their cities in a new way. Because I think um, I saw Didia in the chat saying that a lot of people when they change their signs might think that they're actually doing something to beautify their environment. Um, uh, they don't quite understand the value of neon. So we hope that through our tours and classes and exhibitions, we can really expose the general public to the magic of this art form. Here we're seeing the takedown of our House of Spirits sign, which is the largest 
sign in our collection that we just got this past year. And these are some images of our exhibition space. We have a really great exhibition um, up in our galleries right now to celebrate our 40th birthday. And we also give uh, crews um, and, and tours of the city. So we have the neon cruise, which is a bus tour. And then we also have walking tours that we started during the pandemic. We have an active electric lab where we teach how to bend glass and um, how to design neon artwork. And we have a really vibrant community. It's a really diverse and wonderful group of people that are you know, united by the love of the light. So um, on the left, you'll see our building. Uh, we moved into this building about six years ago. The Museum of Neon Art has um, been a place that hasn't really had a home for a very long time. It's moved around a lot over the course of history of the institution. Um, and it's a really unique institution in that it was built by two artists, um, one who was a high school student at the time that saw that signs were being taken down and sent to the dump. So they thought we need to we need to save these pieces of history. And they saw value in something that at the time was just kind of being sent to the dump. So um, below you can see one of our tour guides and also um, a class who did their, our neon immersive, which is a one day class where you learn how to bend. So just to give you a little primer on neon, um, Many signs and artworks that we call neon actually don't contain neon gas. Uh, most of them actually contain argon mercury and a more accurate term is luminous tubing, but it's sort of like using the term Kleenex when you want a tissue. It just is shorthand when you're talking about neon um, because that was the first um, kind of commercial aspect of signage. It was all filled with neon gas at the beginning in the early 1900s. Um, so when, elect when gas becomes electrified, noble gases like this, this is what they look like. Um, so you're seeing plasma, the same material of the sun and the stars. And that might be one reason why people are so attracted to neon. It's kind of like being a, a, attracted to life force of, you know, these cosmic things that make up who we are. This is Michael Fleckner. He's an extremely skilled artist and bender. His work is on display in our museum and he's known for making these 3D sculptures. Here he's creating um, a airplane and you saw him bending to his pattern. This is called the crossfire. And if you look really closely, you'll see that there are white marks on the tube that's showing him where he needs to um, heat up the glass to bend it. Um, so this is a really concentrated flame for making tight bends in glass. And he has a tube in his mouth um, that he's actually blowing into so that the glass doesn't collapse. So neon um, bending, uh, that's one way of calling it. Some people like to call it glass blowing. Um, but it's a form of glass blowing. So you have this cork on one side and the tube on the other. And that's um, what is inflating the tube and keeping it that same circumference. Here, Michael is um, measuring out with his uh, blow hose the, um, the measurement of the propeller that he's gonna do because you always start with a flat um, or a straight piece of glass when you're bending neon. He makes it look so easy, but it really is not. I had the opportunity to try um, a few months ago and I had, you know, during the pandemic, spent so much time learning about neon and, you know, seeing people do it on videos. And then when you do it, you realize you are in this really intimate relationship with gravity and this, you know, glass starts moving and drooping and you realize your body is not as in sync as you think it's going to be. And it's a really kind of alchemical act to bend neon and people really love to learn. So in order to become an expert bender, it takes many, many years 
lots of repetition, lots of practice. And you can see there, he sort of inflated the tube. Um, but um, it's, it is something that you can dabble in and you can learn. And some people are very good at it right off the bat, but um, it's, it's a humbling art form in a lot of ways. And um, it's, whenever you meet a bender, um, ask them questions. They have so many stories to tell you and um, they have really refined their skills. This is called a ribbon burner. You can see that he's adjusting the size of the flame by pulling out a, a tongue and that's to bend um, shapes like curves and circles because you can heat up a big portion of glass at the same time to have it kind of be supple enough to bend. Now, Michael's weighting down the tube um, so that it'll stay um, sturdy. It's still um, a little bit hot and pliable. And he's rebending a portion of the tube. So you have to be really logistical too when you follow a pattern as a bender. Everyone bends backwards and usually doesn't bend from beginning to end, bends from you know, the center outward because there's all these you know, things you have to consider when you're bending your glass tubing so that you don't heat up a part that was just hot and other things like that. So here you can see he's blowing through and inflating the tube a bit. And this is one of Michael's kind of signatures having this three-dimensional form. This is using a hand torch in order to bond the two pieces of glass together, using a file to cut the glass. And now he's adding the electrodes. So this is what is going to be pumping the gas that will be filled into the sign or artwork with electricity, making it a plasma. Here he's putting uh, mica between the pieces of glass because when this is going to be bombarded or subjected to high voltage electricity, the electricity wants to find the shorter path. So it's gonna jump um, through the glass. So the mica insulates it. This is a vacuum pump attached to the bombarder. These are the different um, tanks of gas, neon, argon, and maybe helium. I don't know what the other gas is there. That's a gauge so he can figure out how much gas he's putting in. It's displaced by the water. And here he's bombarding it. So he's um, subjecting it to high voltage electricity. It gets all bright uh, blue, but this does not have the gas in it, just kind of a vacuum. And here it has the gas inside, that bright red neon. So that's the color of um, neon tubing. Um, if you're interested in learning more about bending in the process, Linda Sue Price, who is a neon artist that took a class with Michael Fleckner several years ago and um, right off the bat sold the piece that she made in her class and then, you know, made another piece and sold that piece. She became a neon artist and she writes about kind of the learning curve of being a neon artist and the process and mindfulness that is required to do this art form. So at Mona, we really um, recognize the history of Los Angeles, as well as many other parts of the world that we have neon from, but our strengths are California and Southern California. This is the Parisian florist. Um, one of the things it's known for is it's where Joe DiMaggio had a standing order um, twice a week of roses to Marilyn Monroe's grave for 20 years. We also have the uh, Chinese dragon um, from Man's Theater. When um, it was preserved, it was preserved to the state before the dragon. So we um, will promise the dragon it was uh, not given to us right away. And by the time it was given to us, it needed massive restoration. So this was a really big project. We also have more kind of common signs that maybe aesthetically you might not, you know, recognize as important, but then when you hear the stories, um, they are really essential um, cultural markers. So this is a sign donated by Marion, um, who is pictured on top of the rugs. 
from her family's business. Her family is Iranian and they took over this business from um, a Armenian family that came to uh, the United States as survivors of the Armenian genocide. So it's kind of the story of two families and you know, making their dreams come true. This is a sign, it's a little blown out, but you can see it on the right, that's a sign in our galleries. And then on the left, you can see that sign on the building. We actually have two of those signs in our collection from um, pre-World War II from Little Tokyo. This was a very um, important sushi restaurant, one of the earliest sushi restaurants in the United States. And we recently uh, got the Circus of Books sign in our collection. And the Circus of Books is kind of another example of a sign that maybe aesthetically um, nothing to write home about, but um, its role as a beacon to uh, the GLBTQAI community is so important. This was um, a haven for many um, young men and some young women during the AIDS crisis, censorship wars. It was a um, bookstore and uh, gay pornography shop. And if you're interested in this story, I highly recommend you watch Rachel Mason's Netflix documentary on her family's business. We also have some Hollywood icons, including the Brown Derby sign from the Hollywood location. And this is how it came to our collection. Um, it is, you know, fully painted and looks great right now. And you'll see another picture of it later on in the slideshow. But um, basically the, the steps in restoring or kind of tending to a sign is um, sanding down the body of the can of the sign. That's what we call the metal part, making a pattern for um, like looking at this sign, you can see on the W, on the right-hand side, there's a spot where the neon would go into the housing of the sign. So we would um, draw a pattern to indicate where we needed to bend the neon so that it will fit into the sign. Uh, we paint the sign, we bend the neon, and we wire it up. When we um, have something that we want to acquire, it's a real, um, effort to um, connect with all the right people. It's really important to have stakeholders in the community, um, the building owner, the store owner, seeing what you know the community wants. Um, of course, it's really important to have these signs up in the world so people you know know what was there and um, can use it as a tool to decipher their environment. But sometimes we can't keep signs in place. So um, this is a image of a takedown of a 76 ball. And um, then we often create bases because these are really <laughs> unwieldy little treasures. So um, we got to wheel them around our exhibition space, our warehouse. And we do a lot of research about permitting and figuring out what the meaning and significance of the sign, talking to community members, et cetera. This is um, our Clayton plumbing sign. And this is a really big sign. So um, when we moved to our location in Glendale, we decided to actually make a scaled down model of the sign for the Paseo little parklet in front of our building. So um, that's what you know remaking a sign looks like. And you probably saw in the video us taking down the House of Spirit sign. This was um, a real uh, endeavor. The House of Spirits has been in Echo Park um, since the 1940s. It was thought that the sign was from the 50s from a sign permit for the installation of the sign at this location. But um, Didia Delizer and Paul Greenstein, who I think are still on this call, um, they took a look at it and said, there's something off here. Um, and on the sign itself, there are some housings and other you know, outlets that were covered up. So we knew that the sign had another home and a summer intern, Maya Abi, actually did uh, some permit research and found a permit for it across the street. So that was a really exciting discovery 
to realize that this sign was actually in fact from the 1940s. The House of Spirits is a sign um, and symbol for Echo Park and the way it has changed over the years. And it's a touchstone for a lot of people. So um, I have this text that uh, Francis Garibay, who's standing there with his son, sent to me um, the day we took down the sign. It was a really emotional time in Echo Park. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, Francis was telling me how he grew up uh, going to the House of Spirits as a little kid and buying chips and um, cookies. And that um, as he got older, he started buying beers. And then now he has a son that, you know, would go there too. So when this uh, building burnt down, it was a real um, sad time for the community, but thankfully, through um, the advocacy of Mona and largely also um, our board president, Eric Linksweiler, who's there holding the neon, and Jackie Tellis, who's next to him, we were able to save the sign um, from being cut up by a developer or being sent to the trash. So it was a very um, important um, project. So um, as I mentioned, the permit um, located the sign behind Pioneer Market. This was owned by the same Libo family that owned the House of Spirits. So because of sign ordinances, many signs in the 1980s were being removed and that corresponds with the birth of Mona. This is a sign from our collection. You can see it here with um, the PC, uh, a restoration of it with the blue hair, as opposed to the right-hand side, which was probably the way it looked on the building. Um, because red, uh, blue uh, neon isn't very legible from the street, but it is very interesting that Spanish dancers were used to advertise Mexican food. And, um, you know, the part of racial politics and other things is definitely part of um, the story of neon. So one way that we try and share the story of Neon and make it accessible to all people is if you go on our website, neonmona.org, you can find a um, bunch of free downloadable guides that are neighborhood walking guides that you can read and you don't have to walk those streets, but I would highly recommend you taking them along um, with your phone to learn about different spots um, neighborhoods in Los Angeles. We started this during the pandemic when um, we were shut down. We thought, why not use um, the world as our museum? We also have a lot of resources on our Instagram. Um, this is called Stroll Through History, and these were takeovers with various historians and comedians and community members sharing stories about their communities and the local neon. We also have a lot of different walking tours that you can join in and you can go on our website and reserve a spot. We have um, a Jewish Lights Over Broadway tour coming up as well as a Chinatown tour coming up. And this is a view of some people on our walking tour. Um, lots of digital content that we've produ been producing that is accessible for free. All of our artist talks are accessible for free and some of our historic talks are available by demand. And uh, you can also check out our studio tours, which are on Instagram. So these are neon vendors that were generous enough to spend the day with us in their studio showing their techniques. This is Danny. she did the first takeover um, she's an amazing artist, and if you're in LA County, you should check out her show in the Palladium Windows that will be up until next week. And here are some more studio takeovers. We also have um, visual descriptions for people that are um, hard of seeing or visual, visually impaired, or just want to, you know, hear descriptions of neon. <laughs> So you can check that out. And we also have a family guide that's freely available online. Here's some images. This is a warehouse. This is the way we store our neon. It's stored on um, kind of chicken wire. Another view of our warehouse. 
and we did a lot of storage. We also try and advocate for local signage. So a really exciting thing that happened was Adore Milk Farms um, sign from the early 1900s was recently uncovered um, and Mona really tried to advocate um, for its preservation in place. Also Alha the Alhambra sign was um, kind of going to be endangered with some bl other signage blight. So um, we try and, you know, tune in whenever any sign seems endangered. This is our um, beginnings of our sign garden. So we're growing the museum. If you can't get enough of neon signs, you should sign up for our neon cruise to Havana. That should be a really um, amazing tour and proceeds from that um, tour will go directly into helping to fund restoration efforts in Cuba. You can also support our museum by going into our web store, buying our amazing um, book, Neon. It's not our amazing book, it's in our store, but Neon, A Light History, which was written by Didier Delizer and Paul Greenstein and beautifully laid out and created by SF Neon. And thank you so much for joining me today and um, feel free to reach out to me um, C. Siegel at neonmona.org. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Corey. And you have set us up perfectly for the next speakers. Um, speaking of SF Neon, welcome Al and Randall. Uh, you. You go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Corey, for, and, and Chris Nichols for great presentations. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, setup. yeah, you know a lot about neon, so we're going to go full on to the neon and noir. Let's see if I can pull up our slides. Yeah. yeah. And all right, we should we be there. Okay, uh, just we'll just reintroduce ourselves for those of you who might have joined late. Uh, this is Randall Ann, and I'm Al. Randall Ann Holman, Al Barner, and we are San Francisco Neon. A two-person, tiny nonprofit. Yes, a very small nonprofit organization that's dedicated to preserving the legacy of vintage commercial neon signage through various modes like publications, preservation, education, histo history tours, and sign rescue projects. And uh, we are both really big fans of film noir, so yeah, let's roll right in there. Yeah, so... Um, Oh. But really quickly, we just, since Corey showed all the great projects that they do and we're inspired to save some of the smaller signs um, in San Francisco. That's right. We don't have a warehouse yet. Yeah, we have, we have a warehouse, but, but we do have a lot of small uh, historic um, organizations that are realizing that these signs are, are cultural assets and are, are really starting to take over um, take them and restore them. So we're so happy for the um, Chinese Historical Society of America and the community in Chinatown, also in the, the Mission and the Excelsior Action Group. Um, and we've got a great program in the Tenderloin neighborhood with the Tenderloin Museum called um, Tenderloin Neon A to Z. And we actually get funded by the city to restore signs in that neighborhood. So it keeps us pretty busy. Right, we, that project started with a windshield survey and we progressed to actually saving or restoring a, a number of signs. The pandemic has slowed the process down a little bit, but we're raring to go and get back out on the streets and get these signs lit. And, and hopefully um, we'll start our walking tours again. We've done quite a few online tours and um, well, more about that later. Let's get into the noir. Okay, all right, well, we're going to start by showing uh, our first, well, Randall's going to talk about the visual style. Right. Okay. So if you're not already a noir fan and you're wondering like, what is this sort of all about? Um, let's see. Oh, I don't want this live. Oh, maybe I do. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see composition, lighting, focus, camera position. These are all the visual style of um, of dark films, which is a, a loose translation of film noir. And these were very popular in the 40s and 50s and just a little bit into the 60s. 
um, as being realistic, but in fact, they are actually quite stylized. So one thing that we see in these films is the composition. And this is where cinematographers really put neon to work. Um, and this kind of really asymmetrical off balance composition that you'll see so often they use neon laden streets in the background to really, to really give the composition context and put it into an urban setting. Uh, focus too, this, I love this um, shot from out of the past where there's equal emphasis on the foreground, the background, and then the neon sign teeters is just right in the middle. Again, lighting the scene, creating context. Um, and available lighting, this is also a real hallmark of, of the film noir where you're using all the ambient light in the street scene. And in those days, it was all, it was all neon, dark shadows, no fill lights, and uh, really creates all this this dark, mysterious ambiance. Uh, last thing is camera angle. And a neon sign was just perfect um, to be in the foreground. And it really sets the scene in these kinds of shots that are usually set from either very high angle or very low angle. So that's your little film noir 101. And we're going to start with our, we're going to start with LA and move into San Francisco. That's right. Uh, we'll start with our first, uh clip that we'll look at tonight is from The Crimson Kimono. Uh, interesting film produced, written, and directed by Sam Fuller. Uh, was kind of ahead of its time in terms of its take on race relations. Uh, as you can tell, if you read in the lobby card there, you know, a Japanese boy and an American girl involved it's in a It's actually a Japanese cop, right? It's a well, yeah, mystery, not only yeah. is he a Japanese boy, he's, he's a, a Japanese detective. Cop, yeah. He's a detective. So let's get right to that. Uh, okay, so let we're gonna play, we have a, a number of little one minute clips because we really want you to get the feel of how cinematographers use the neon in these scenes. Um, they, they really do the work. And this is also just a great overview of, San, of uh, Los Angeles in 1959. Oh, and very quick before you play, just double checking, yeah. did you optimize for uh, video when you shared it? We did. we did. Yeah. Okay. And is our is the closed caption thing working? We have a little message. It should be. Yeah, I see it okay. on. Okay, great. That's good. I think you can close that message in case it's making one of those gray bars. Okay. All right. Are we ready to roll, Jonathan? Uh, yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Crimson Kimono was directed by Sam Fuller. And Fuller was noted for his explosive opening scenes in his movies, and The Crimson Kimono was no exception. Uh, Neon served his purpose as well as we see what happens when Burlesque Queen Sugar Torch, played by Gloria Paul, opens the wrong door at the wrong time. Now, this is this all is, real ne neon, this, right? Yeah, this is neon on the old Burbank Theater, which was on Main Street in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, the Burbank Local Mall to make And you know, maybe some of our uh, Angelino audience uh, will be able to answer this question. We're curious if the burlesque tubing, the burlesque neon uh, lighting was made for the movie or if it actually always sat in front of the raceway lettering that says Burbank, which you can see behind the word burlesque. So if there's anybody out there who knows, we'd appreciate that. All right. so. Um... Let's go to this next one we've got queued up for Los Angeles. And this isn't necessarily no noir, which Crimson Kimono was just hardcore film noir, everything about it. But two years later, this really unusual docudrama film was made called The Exiles. And it really documents the same neighborhood, that main street of Los Angeles, but it really focuses on uh, unusual subculture which was Native Americans who had all gathered and you know, left the Southwest and had moved to uh, the gritty neighborhood of Bunker Hill. And again, it's just a un either, I don't know if it's intended or unintended documentation of the street life and particularly the signs 
um, in this movie. And I'm just gonna show a short clip and just a little background. Uh, it really follows the story of a very lonely young wife, uh, Vaughn and her rather rowdy husband who prefers to hang out with his buddies than um, hang out with her. And this is just kind of a, a, a beautiful street scene that we'll take a look at. And this is, um, this is a great point of view. Again, very unusual angle looking down the royal liquor sign that you that you see shows up again and again in this film and we just want to give you a little taste of it so hopefully you'll go go watch it and um let's just roll this All right that's the angel angel's flight um vehicular am i saying that right railroad uh vehicular and there's the main street again all all a glow and neon I don't know that any of those signs still exist. And we get this very intimate look of Yvonne wishing she was having fun with the boys. And uh, in that really um, beautiful film noir style of loneliness and despair, um, she's heading to the movie theater by herself while the boys are going to hang out with their community and group at, and ends with this beautiful look at the Cafe Ritz sign. So that's our little look at the Exiles. It really is an amazing film and uh, a, and it was a, done as a student film. Yeah, um, uh, the filmmaker was actually a student at uh, USC at the time. All right. So again, Neon, neon doing the work. Okay, now we're now we're in Hollywood. Okay, we're going to and move San on. Francisco. We're in San Francisco. Yeah, now we're back in San Francisco, and we're going to look at uh, one of the, one of our favorite uh, scenes from the movie Dark Passage. Uh, so, in this in this movie, uh, what we're going to see is Vincent Parry, who is played by Humphrey Bogart. Uh, he is on the run. He's escaped from San Quentin Prison, uh, where he was incarcerated for the murder of his wife, which of which he was actually innocent. He broke out. He has no idea what his next steps are going to be when he receives some unexpected but welcome advice from a street smart cabbie. And take a look at the rear window. It's just classic B-roll. Sure, now you, for instance, you're a guy with plenty of trouble. I don't have a trouble in the world. Don't tell me, buddy. I know. Yeah, she gave you plenty of trouble, that dame. So you slugged her. Not now, not here. Too many cops around. Don't try hitting me in the back of the head or I'll run this crate up into one of those hotel lobbies. I'll give you $500. Don't give me nothing. Where do you want to go? Might as well make it the police station. Don't be like that. You're doing all right. You're doing fine. Oh, if it was easy for you to spot me, it'd be easy for others. That's where you're wrong. Unless you'd be happier back in Quentin. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That, that's why they sent us up there, to keep us happy. I see what you mean. Let's go up here and talk. All right. Uh, now, when that taxi cab comes down Kearney Street and turns onto Geary, this, the screen explodes with neon and you see a lot of different styles of signs or sign typologies. You have a uh, projecting sign like the Pastine sign that you see on the top of the image. And then you have a fascia sign with Pastine's against the building facade. Which I think is also a raceway, right? It, it, looked, yeah, it is it looks a raceway, like raceway sign as well where the letters are extended above the tin can. Uh, so uh, there's some, uh, as they go around the curve, you also see some uh, skeleton neon, which is a neon trim that you usually see in, in plate glass, in, on the inside of the interiors, the plate glass windows. Uh, there's just a lot of different signage here. And uh, well, it creates this whole vibrant nightlife scene in San Francisco in 1947 when the movie was made. And one reason we love this shot is because when we moved to San Francisco, Pastines was still open and we used to go there. So we're so excited to see this in a Humphrey Bogart movie. That's right, I, I was in Pastines on their closing night. 1977. Oh, okay, you said the date. Well, here's a, a, a view, a less sinister view, maybe maybe a less romantic view of that same corner uh, taken 10 years later. I think this was 
1957, this photograph. Uh, and you can see that neon actually wasn't all black and white. It actually had different colors. And I think uh, Corey gave a good overview of uh, color and tube bending. So we can dispense with all of that information because you've got it. But uh, this, was, this was a great uh, corner for neon. Uh, and one of the things you might notice if you were paying close attention, the traffic routes have changed. Uh, Kearney Street is now one way heading uh, north and Geary Street is one way uh, coming the other way, heading, anyways, heading the other east. way yeah. of what they are now. Right. And we just always have to give a shout out to OpenSF History. They have an amazing photo database and lots of great um, color slides like this. So if, if you're if you're looking for more San Francisco historical photos, go the there. Place. Yeah, that's the place. All right, moving on to Lady from Shanghai. This is uh, Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth's um, uh, basically trip around the world that ends in Chinatown in San Francisco. And it's kind of a crazy plot, but it's a beautiful film. And it really, again, is a unattended documentary of what Chinatown, Grant Avenue in particular, um, looked like in 1947. So we're gonna play this clip and then we're gonna talk about a couple of signs that are in this movie that we still have today. All right, so here go Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth in Chinatown. All right, so um, our multilingual friends tell us that uh, the languages switch from Cantonese to Mandarin with a few Japanese phrases thrown in in that clip. Um, but but it's but its view of Grant Avenue is just so so authentic. And one of the amazing things is that um, you know chop suey was what tourists had when they came to Chinatown in the '40s. And this beautiful beautiful composition on the left, which shows off the chop suey and down main sign. Amazingly, that sign, the metal cabinet still exists. And it was once um, when it stopped serving chop suey, um, the restaurant was called the Lotus Garden. It was one of the very early vegetarian restaurants um, in San Francisco that was run by a group of Buddhists. Um, so this is a sign we would love to see restored on Grant Ave. But let's look at another sign. And that is um, right above Orson Welles' head, you can see that it says, Fong Fong, um, and it's right in front of the Royal House Art Goods. And that was a really well, well loved bakery and ice cream by ice cream store by locals. It really was was for locals. And as you can see, it the facade was just covered with neon. And in the center was this beautiful porcelain neon ice cream cone held up by two traditionally um, dressed children, maybe maybe they're hugging it. And when we saw this photo from the Chinese Historical Society of America's archive, we just thought, I, we just can't believe that this is gone. It's just, it's such a loss for the neighborhood. And um, this is what happens when you start talking about neon on Facebook. We got a 
email from David Webb, who is a neon sign collector up in Washington, and he has the Fong Fong ice cream cone and has preserved it and taken care of it. It's an amazing sign if you um, know that porcelain is glass baked onto metal, it's not painted. And this is very unusual because there's so many different colors of porcelain glass. Um, so we'd love to see this sign come back to Granow someday. Uh, and we've also heard that um, the children of the bakers and ice cream makers at Fong Fong's still have books of all the recipes, so it could happen. Uh, okay, and this sign we just absolutely love. It's one of our favorite signs in San Francisco. Um, it's the Lee Po Cocktail Lounge, and you can see it there behind um, Rita Hayworth's head. We don't think she was standing on Grand Avenue. We think that's for a projection, but it absolutely dates this sign to 1947. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also very unusual in that it's 3D. It's really built to um, replicate some of the light, decorative light posts on Grand Ave. And we really were so honored um, to be part of the restoration of this sign, which was restored by Lee Po Management and also by SF Shines, which is a really wonderful matching grant program um, in, by the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. And so you can see the shape that it was in when we got involved and it really needed, it really needed some restoration. And we were thrilled to be able to do some research. We actually grabbed paint chips and um, make a color consult for the traditional colors and also colors of the glass tubes. And we went with the traditional, the neon um, argon, but also the colorful glass novial gold, which is gold during the day. And also we changed the arrow to be green and all of those colors signify good luck in the Chinese community. So Li Po's management was really happy with these color choices. And with all that good luck, the sign lights up every night. And with all that good luck, the signs lights up every night. And when Lipo opens again, you just got to go down and try one of their Chinese Mai Tais. We recommend one per customer. I, I found out the hard way. Okay, here we go. Okay, our next movie is Race Street. Uh, and the, the scene we're going to look at is uh, going to be <clears throat> the classically wooden performance of George Raft with William Bendix. Uh, Raft plays a, uh, a bookie whose uh, associate has been murdered. He's out for revenge. Bendix is a cop. He's also an old friend of, of Raft's character. So he's trying to talk him out of doing anything irrational. Uh, they're walking on a treadmill with rear projection of what looks to be Market Street here in San Francisco. And uh, they're gonna get off that treadmill, cross Market Street, uh, in front of one of our favorite movie theaters in the city. Okay. Yeah, it's a great place, San Francisco. We got everything. Say, how would you like a cup of the best coffee in town? Where will we get it? At the station house. <laughs> well, Here's the good old Golden Gate. All right, the good old Golden Gate and the great news about the Golden Gate Theater. Um, we see it here when it was the RKO Golden Gate. And there's that unbelievably beautiful neon marquee, which is just lined in neon in every possible surface. Um, all of this is sadly gone now. It's a LED marquee, but the two beautiful vertical signs still exist. And you can see on the left how it really gotten faded and fallen in disrepair. And luckily two years ago, um, both of these signs were repainted. They almost got converted to LED, but luckily the um, project manager called us, had us come down and let us talk him out of it. Uh, so they didn't have the budget for neon, but luckily it was not an LED conversion. And that's what it would have looked like if they had brought back the neon. Again, classic neon, argon, and novial gold. So if the budget ever shows up, we'd love to see these signs. At least they compromised. And they didn't put, yeah. on, put on uh, glass, but they also did not put on the, uh, the LED, LED tubing. So we considered that a, we considered that a win. 
the man who cheated himself. Okay, this is a pretty obscure noir, but it gives us an amazing view of the Golden Gate Bridge and also just loaded with neon symbolism. This was a, a, a really rare uh, lead for Lee J. Cobb, who's a character actor. And he is a man on the run and in trouble. And let's just take a look at um, him trying to uh, do something he shouldn't. All right, so here's our view of the Golden Gate Bridge. And there is the beautiful neon clock that's telling him he is out of time, he's on the run. Even the toll booth is saying, stop, pay toll. And that neon arrow is accusatory pointing at him. He's about to dispose of the evidence off the side of the Golden Gate Bridge. And he's ignoring all these visual neon um, symbolic signs. And he's just forging ahead. And this is just a, a great view of the actual toll booth. This is all on location. And um, as we see him drive off in the rear view mirror, there's the clock watching him. Uh, so just, just, I just love this, um, the symbolism and the way the cinematographer used the neon. And we also really love this clock, which still exists. The, this neon clock has been over the tool, toll booth, even though you don't stop and pay the toll anymore. And it was restored when? Well, well, the original clock, you see the installation photo on the left, uh, that went up in 1949. And it was installed by a company called QRS Neon, who actually had their offices in the Golden Gate Theater building. And that original clock was replaced with a modern mechanical replica in 2003. And that replica was removed in 2014 for restoration. And it was reinstalled in April of 2015. So it's got a long history. Uh, you can see the color of the clock face has changed. But when the clock was removed in, in 2014, uh, it created quite an uproar. There was a lot of concern about what was going to happen or what happened to the clock, because it is, it is a landmark. It's maybe not as prominent as the Golden Gate Bridge itself. But it's well loved. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, I know that we um, are getting close to our question and answer period. So we're in the home stretch. Our last film is Vertigo, probably one of the most iconic films about San Francisco and is considered a noir, even though it's in color. That's right. Okay, we're gonna look at a couple or two, I think we have two clips. And two here, short clips. Here's a short clip of uh, James Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, walking up Sutter Street in San Francisco. Uh, the coffee shop you see on the right still exists. Uh, and uh, we're just going to run this and you'll see. The focus is really the Empire, um, the Empire Hotel right. sign. This is, this is kind of our bedtime story about uh, conflict between fear and obsession. Yeah. And obsession is going to be where we put the emphasis. All right, here we go. And that is the real That's the Hotel, hotel Empire. Empire. Gone now, but... The hotel still exists. It's now called the Vertigo Hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we are on a soundstage. Yeah, this is done back in on the Hitchcock, LA soundstage. Yeah, Hitchcock recreated that neon sign just for this look and the green glow, which right. was so well, iconic to well, the Well, at least movie. they recreated uh, two or three of the letters. I don't know if they did the whole the whole sign, but... Uh, oh, we got to find out. <laughs> was it really the whole sign or just a few letters? All right, so this is the obsession with Ju Judy, who is um, hoping to uh, change her look. Um, well, we don't want to give the plot away, but this is where Judy becomes Madeline. And Jimmy Stewart is quite um, surprised and delighted and obsessed. That green glow. And in fact, there's an art film called The Green Glow, um, which recreates the whole plot of Vertigo with other movies. That's right. Oh, Green Fog. Green it's called Fog Green Fog. By, uh, guy, uh, Madden. Yeah. Guy Madden. Um, we should we should have had it queued up a but but that's e easy to Google, easy to find. But ju just amazing how the neon glow creates 
all of the aura and mystery of this very central scene in Vertigo. I, I think the Bernard Herrmann score contributes to yeah. that as well. But. All right. All right. I know we're getting ready for questions. So we've just got a couple of little things um, to share with you. And one is join us for a neon symposium festival. This is so much fun. We have people literally from Europe, Australia, all, all kinds of places who are saving neon sign or making neon art are just into the neon subculture. Right. And some um, of them are actually in the audience tonight. Some of them are in the audience tonight. Um, and uh, it's it's a real community gathering and information sharing. Register now, early bird passports are free. Um, we'd love to know how many people are interested, neonspeaks.org and uh, September 11th and 12th yeah. and 18th, 19th. So we don't all have Zoom fatigue. It'll be all online this year. Hopefully following years, we'll be able to do it in person. If you missed last year, don't worry. Um, you can access the recording vault and see all 20 presentations. It really was an, an amazing collection of people doing neon work all over the world, really. And so um, it's free for the month of June, so don't miss that. And um, John, do you want us to show this neon noir film or should we go straight to questions? Hi, I think we should go straight to questions because we have to let John go. He actually yeah. needs to catch the ferry back across the bay and he's going to switch host over to me and we're hoping it doesn't interrupt our Facebook video. Okay. <laughs> so, um, John, you can go ahead and switch me to the host and we do have a lot of Q&A and we do want to get to that. Um, but uh, if you have the, it says I'm the host now, so hopefully we're still streaming on Facebook, but why don't I go ahead and, um, and have you stop sharing. If you do have the, uh, that video available to share, you can post that in the uh, link in okay. the chat and people can That's watch it because it is really cool. But we do want to get to some of these and Gretchen and Chris and Corey, you can come on. There we go. All right. So um, Gretchen is going to help me out with these Q and A's, but I'll start and then Gretchen, you take number two. Why don't I start with uh, any information? This is from Rick. Uh, Ann and Randall, do you have any information about the first aid sign on the public health building in the Civic Center? Uh, I wonder if it's Roger Perotti that asked that question, but we, we know all about it. And we have long been searching for a photo of it glowing at night. We've, we've heard stories that when people were in need of first aid, they, they really did look for that neon glow. Um, there are a number of people in the planning department that are convinced that it needs to stay. So we're feeling hopeful about that, but no other specific info. It's, it's an interesting sign. It's, uh, the tin can is actually cast iron. Mm -hmm. so. Very unusual. All right, I'm next. Um, there's a great question I think we'll open up to the whole panel, which is how do we dispel NEON's association as an outdated form for businesses that are in the process of remodeling? We, who wants to take, we of course have opinion. Anybody else want to take that? I think you should go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, one new NEON is really a, a selling point for old NEON. And um, one thing to keep in mind that LEDs eventually go into the landfill. Almost everything in a neon sign um, is recyclable. And talk about sustainability. These signs have been around for 70 years. And some people ask us, how long does a neon sign last? And we like to say, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Because neon signs like Lee Poe's, it's been around for 75 years and it's, More. it's going strong. Now, transformers always need to be switched out. Um, but the glass and the tubes and the metal cabinets, those signs were made with really good metal. Um, and sure, they can get rusty, but if you keep them painted and take care of them, they can last a really long time. And in terms of energy consumption, uh, neon sign is much closer to LEDs in consumption than incandescent bulbs. Incandescent bulbs take this much electricity, neon sign about this much, this much for LEDs. So even in, when they were invented, they were considered uh, you know, cost savings in terms of electricity. Right, and I think what, what I think convinces people is if you can show them that the visceral quality that you get from a neon glow is something you can never reproduce with LED, 
that goes a long way in terms of uh, swaying the uh, conversation. The other thing we say is that when you restore a neon sign, um, the whole neighborhood turns out, music, there's party, it's a celebration. When you put up an LED sign, it's kind of a disappointment. That's true, which, which brings us back to Chris, but I think uh, maybe the, uh, the questioner was asking if you all remember, I think we talked about this in our practice session. I remember being in Glendale in the 70s, uh, probably early 70s, I believe, and the, up to the mid 80s where neon was seen as this sort of, um, like it was bad, you know, it represented, maybe it was from the Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood effect, but neon was bad. And there was a whole movement in Glendale, which is the irony, Corey, that the Museum of Neon Art is in Glendale, because when I was growing up there, they had a huge effort to basically eliminate all the neon, including the um, historic sign at the Alex Theater uh, was going to be removed. Uh, they removed the Roxy, they removed, I think the Glendale Theater at the same time. Like they basically like took away and you showed the La Fonda one. So that was pretty sad, but I wanted to ask Chris Nichols, isn't the oldest neon in Los Angeles in the basement at Clifton's? Yes. <laughs> um... It's still there, right? Yeah, it is down well, by the bathrooms. Closed. Um, gosh, any any oldest question takes more research than I have done <laughs> on that sign. So it's it's very old and it's still operating. Oldest operating, I think well, they yeah, found it, it underneath the, the the facade that was up the entire time I lived and in it was LA. Continuously operating, yeah, since that time. Um, but yeah, that the whole wonderful Clifton's, um, you know. Uh, What's left of questions uh, is 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 in, is in closed because of the pandemic. Thank you, Corey. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's um, well, two things. One that Glendale has definitely gone full circle because with a lot of the planning of um, the new arts district in Glendale, all the signage and wayfinding is neon. Um, and you know we have the Lafonda sign because of um, sign ordinances, and this sort of um, noir reputation for neon being like a foreboding symbol. Yet at the same time, there is so much amazing art that's being created today by extremely talented vendors. Um, I, I'd recommend. Um, going on our page and finding the vendors that do takeovers for Mona because you can really see there's just such an amazing group of talent. Another organization to follow is called She Bends. It's all um, female identifying artists that bend their own neon. And neon is alive and well. So I think that um, being aware that artists are actively making and a lot of new um, businesses want a neon sign because it's you know, come back into the cool factor. And part of that is because of its, you know, it has some CD associations that are also making it cooler um, now than it ever was before. So um, I think it's a really positive time for Neon because of the artists that are working in it and the businesses that are recognizing this value. And it's handmade. All Neon's made by hand. I have a question actually for Corey. I know you just talked about it. I was wondering as you were speaking, how do you in the museum convey the context of the locations from where these signs were? Like, how do you, how do you show that in the interpretation? Each sign we have on display has a didactic that tells the story, but then also our staff is trained to share these stories because I think a lot of it is sort of oral history and a lot of it is like, people coming into the museum and they will see a sign and their mouth will water because they'll think about the pastrami sandwich they ate there or their t their eyes will water because they think about the story that they had in relationship to the sign. So it's very people focused, um, which is another reason to really shout out the amazing work um, in Neon, A Light History um, by SF Neon and Didi Deliza and Paul Greenstein because it really shows that Neon is a community endeavor and um, it's always been um, about people, about the people who make the signs, about the people who run the businesses um, that choose the Neon signs and also the people just illuminated by the signage. So 
we do a lot of work um, and we're expanding our kind of story collection and oral history collection about um, neon signage because that's so much a part of, it's, it's everyone's story. It's very kind of democratic medium in that way. Thanks, Corey. I have a question for Alan Randall about uh, Fong Fong. Was the entire facade graphic pattern also porcelain enamel? It makes the entire facade a sign and ties in visually with the symmetry of the sign. So was it porcelain enamel, the Fong Fong sign? You know, that wasn't necessarily typical at that time. Um, but because that entire sign and ice cream cone is so elaborate, um, so we, we don't know because the facade has been destroyed, but I, I, would, I would say that would be pretty unusual, but the, but the ice cream cone is definitely porcelain and yeah. amazing that- this, And I think it's got 12, at least 12- 12 different colors, colors which most porcelain signs were three colors, so. Yeah. Oh, great, <laughs> I wanted to start wrapping it up. So um, Chris, I had a question for you. What do you have next on your plate? Since I know that you are always working on a, a great book about uh, you know, vintage or architecture or something like that. What do you got going? Well, um, I recently did a book about a, an artist named um, Rolly Crump, who uh, worked with, the, with Walt Disney. Um, and it's, it's, he's, he's nine, in his 90s and in San Diego, and an incredible artist, you should look him up. Um, and I have a um, project about bowling architecture that I'm working on. Um, you know, being that there have been some uh, big preservation issues like the Covina Bowl in the last few years, I've had bowling on my mind and um, did an exhibition on modern bowling architecture that I'm trying to turn into a book right now. And the big question, Chris, are you coming out here to Orlando for the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World? <laughs> Come on, I'll show you around. I'll give you I'll the personal ride. tour. Go to <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, how about you, Corey? What do you have coming up next? Any exhibits uh, that people can look forward to at Mona? We have a lot of really exciting classes and walks on the horizon. We just um, May 1st reopened after a year and I think three months of closure. So that exhibition will be up for a while. And then in the fall, we'll have um, some more exhibitions coming. Great. And then also Alan Randall, what do you, you showed us that you are having a tours or, or you're having online. And then uh, I hope that you, what else do you have going on? Any more books coming out? Well, this, this summer we're um, part of the San Francisco Public Library um, Summer Stride. And so what we have coming up in a couple of weeks uh, is a book launch for Neon Light History. So this is really our big new project. And um, so Didi and Paul will be talking about the book. We'll also have some local tube vendors. There you go. Chris, thank you for doing that. Um, so we're real excited about that. And these, you know, who knew? Online book launches, they're super fun. And then in July, we're actually going to do a neon and matchbook um, walking to our San Francisco online with San Francisco Public Library. And you can register for both at sfneon.org. Wonderful. And I see that we have good news that says Covina Bowl is being restored. That was in the chat. So there are some good things. And it's, I'm very proud of my hometown of Glendale for bringing it all back around and embracing their neon history. Uh, so we're going to close it up. I wanted to thank all of you. Uh, maybe Gretchen, you could post again the link in the chat for the did. survey. Oh my gosh, she's so good. <laughs> she's ahead of me. Like every On it. Minute. Um, I wanted to thank you all for sharing your expertise. It's been a great honor. And I love the way that you all rolled with our, with our, our webinars, uh, you know, with the hot foot we have usually here. But anyway, thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. And we will be going on for a little bit more tomorrow. We have one more free program, uh, which is with the Getty uh, Conservation uh, Institute tomorrow at 9 a.m. If you want to find out more about their free publications available to the public and all of us scholars as well. Anyway, thank you all, and I'm glad you could join. Thank, thank you, you and so happy to be with Corey and, and Chris, and um, thank Gretchen. you to, yeah. Thank you, and Gretchen. Gretchen, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John, he's gone, but uh, thank yeah. you, John. <laughs> okay. See you soon. Thanks so much. Thank Good night, you everybody. So Good night. Bye. Bye.